Hi and welcome to this week's episode of Off the Hill, the ANU's weekly look at what's been happening in the 2016 federal election campaign. As always, I'm joined by my co-hosts, constitutional law expert Ryan Goss and political marketing expert Andrew Hughes. And as always, if you're in Canberra on Tuesday night, come along to our weekly public policy forum. This week it's talking about climate change, energy and the environment. All the details that you need are on the ANU website at anu.edu.au. Now, we've had a think this week about who is actually watching at this point. Who are we talking to in, in regards of the election? And, and who is really at this point still thinking about who they might vote for? Now, from 2013, we have some kind of idea of this, that about 50% of people don't even think about how they vote. We've asked this in the Australian election study. They, they knew long ago. They've never really given it any thought. About a third decide during the campaign at some point, right? That's kind of good to know. Mm. But 10% decide on election day. On the day itself. On the day itself. Yeah. And this is self-reported. This is what they say they, they do. <clears throat> about half of those seem to be actually really rational, really c cautiously thinking about the issues. They're just taking their time to, you know, to come to their, their own decision. About half of those just don't care. Now, what do you think about this, Andrew? Oh, look, it's natural to me because after <laughs> all, you know, you think about politics for most people. Us, yes, we're involved with it. We're in, interested and engaged with it. Mm. Most people, no. I mean, most people, mm. there's an issue or two, yeah, where it's nice, it's hot, it, they, it's something they care about. But politics overall, they don't really give much thought to it. Well, that's that 50% really. Who, exactly right. Who don't think, they don't engage, they vote usually for who their parents voted for. Yeah, exactly. And, and look, you can play this a bit too as a politician like Turnbull has. He's made his campaign nice and boring, nice mm. and flat. And it's a good tactic. It's a good strategy because then people don't get engaged. There's no traction or momentum to be gained by the opposition. They have to take all the running with this um, because they know people aren't listening. They're going to switch off in a long ca campaign. You could say anything by week five. We could say anything in week five. <laughs> and I, 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 I think... I'll just stop you there. <laughs> I, I, th I think there's also an appetite um, after the last six or ten years for boring politics, I think, that, that for a long time there, whether it was the hung parliament yeah. or the leadership squabbles, mm. people had to pay attention and felt, <coughs> felt obliged to pay attention yeah. to what was going on in politics. And but there's, an, there's a craving to not have to do that. Yeah, but I think maybe that after that, that period's ended, um, people have just gone, I've had enough of politics for a bit. Yeah. It was so negative and it was so nasty and it was so really personal too. It wasn't on issues. People just went, why be engaged if all you guys could do is hate each other? And I think we've had enough of that at the moment. Now, I think, and, and I, you know, I, I don't like doing this, but I think overnight we've heard that this isn't always the case. Yeah, and, and um, very sad news overnight of the death of Joe Cox, the killing of Joe Cox mm. in, um, on the streets of London, campaigning in the context of the um, EU Brexit referendum. Um, we don't, the facts aren't entirely clear at this stage, but it's a reminder that, um, that, that politics can um, have real impacts on, on the people who are practi practicing it, on the mm. practitioners in politics, um, and, and that we um, perhaps owe a little bit more sympathy to our politicians some of the time and to remember that they're motivated by, um, for almost all of the time, by good intentions and yeah. vulnerable intentions. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, yeah. But I think more generally it's also a reminder <coughs> that um, you know, there are many people in Australia who are disengaged from politics. The difference that in Australia compared to many other countries is that all of those people are obliged to vote. Um, are compelled to vote, which is yeah, not the case yeah. in the US or the UK or, or Canada or these places. Yeah. And so I think that creates a different dynamic in Australia. And also just mm, the, it does. And, and the fact that we've um, had a quarter of a century without a recession, we've had been pretty comfortable in Australia for 25 years. Yeah. Um, one could be forgiven for thinking that, that politics didn't matter and that it was a logical choice not to pay too much attention. There is yeah. a, a strong argument that compulsory voting uh, almost um, creates an environment of stability. Yeah, that we th we do have to think about politics occasionally, uh, and that it's good for us, mm. but that we don't think about it in these huge spikes up and down, heaps of passion that we see in a lot of other countries. Yeah, we've heard so many now, changes to prime ministers too, where where there hasn't been much really to upset people. People have seen those mm. changes and gone, okay, well, it was due to this issue or that issue. We haven't been that concerned over the future of our democracy. True. Now, one place that uh, I know you both are passionate about, and where pa people are passionate about politics, is Queensland. Andrew. <laughs> Bob Catter, our force from the it's, north, right? You love him. Yeah, look, and, and Queensland itself is interesting because of the dynamics in the campaign. All those marginal seats, you have to win them um, to win government overall. Yep. Um, and there's like nine, I think, they've identified now, all the way up the Queensland coast. 
starting all the way from basically Brisbane itself, going as far north as Cairns and, and Cape York. So, you know, it's a huge geographical area, huge diversity to of opinions and views. Um, and, and Turnbull's doing very, very well in Brisbane itself. This is the thing to note, which is why it's really hard at the moment for Labor to get traction in Queensland. They're trying their best. They're up there all the time. They're sending people up there all the time. But Brisbane isn't Queensland. No, it's to not. To a large extent. No, yeah. and, and, and dare I say, because being a Queenslander, as Brian is, you don't ever say that you're, you know, from Queensland. If you're from Brisbane, you're from Brisbane, and then yep. there's the rest of Queensland. I'm surrounded well, by you. Well, Andrew doesn't speak for me. I'm a Queenslander. But, <laughs> but, um, but, but I think um, in, t in political terms, the dynamic is, is, is different in Queensland in so many ways. But one of the ways in which it's different is that um, there are two conservative parties in Queensland that are quite powerful. The National Party is the yeah. main, or the, yep. the remnants of the National Party is the main conservative force in Queensland, which is true of no other state. And that continues to be true, particularly outside of Brisbane. But you see a dynamic where Brisbane itself yeah. begins to look like Sydney and Melbourne in the sense that mm. the Liberal Party is the increasingly um, the major conservative political force. And there's that tension within the conservative side of politics, yeah. but also between Labor and those other two points of the triangle. And, and then, and then outside of that, you have Catter, and you raised yeah. Catter. Now, Catter this week has, has caused all kinds of controversy, but yeah, that's but this is his right. MO, right? Yeah, exactly right. And look, he he's the no-filter politician of Australia. So we're talking is, about his ad here. Exactly yeah, right. But his ad, he's look everything he talks about usually is done to get awareness and get a reaction to what he's saying. It's not about what he's saying necessarily, it's about the reaction to what he's saying. Now, yeah, awareness and reaction for. are slightly different. Exactly right. So in this case, his ad's all about getting the, that reaction from people. And this time, look, in the context of what's happened now in the last week across the world, it looks bad and it is bad. It's kind of toned down. There are other ways to get responses like that, not using that sort of issue. And number one in politics, go the issue, not the person. And we're talking about him. So look, we are. he's one, right? I know. You'd say that, right? And come on, we have to talk about him. <laughs> and, and 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 he's successfully <coughs> obtained attention even here on even here on off the hill. So I think that's yeah. mission accomplished um, for Bob Carter. But that's I think true. He was he was hoping he to was get hoping our attention. <laughs> 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 he's watching right now. Yeah, that's a, Bob, uh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> now on preferences, we do have to move on. On preferences, this has been the other thing of the week. The other yeah. the other side issue with which we're all mildly obsessed, but we can't yeah. quite say why. Now I don't. I think prefer preferences are a big deal. And they're yeah. a big deal because they, they have two different effects, right? One is this instrumental effect that, yes, about 50% of the population do use how to vote cards when they apportion their preferences, right? So yeah. they, it has a, a strong effect on election day. Uh, it helps low information voters, most of whom wouldn't vote if they weren't compelled. So, you know, we're helping them along the way. The other thing is that it has this really fun expressive effect. Yeah. And that's what we've seen, for instance, in the seat of Sydney, uh, where... You know, well, the Greens have now backtracked where they were going to preference the the uh, Fred Nile Christian Democratic Party candidate over the, you know, who they sort of thought was a very urbane, uh, gay, indigenous liberal candidate. Now, what do you think about all this, Ryan? Well, I think the, the as you say, the trading of preferences or the apparent trading preferences at this stage of the campaign is really about sending a message to voters that yep. um, we think the Greens are worse than this party, yeah. we think the Christian Democrats are worse than this Haven't party. Have you heard that all week? We yeah. think Labor's better than these guys. Um, but I think it's worth remembering in this campaign, different to every campaign in living memory, that the trading of preferences is really only about what goes on the how to vote card. In yep. the past, mm. before the Senate voting changes, it fed into behind the scenes yep. um, mathematical counting of the votes. That's not the case now. It's only the case if voters pay attention to those how to vote cards. Well, remember that there's still about half of the exactly. half of all voters. Yeah. And the Senate, I think, will really help uh, this year in, in terms of using how to vote cards because people are going to be confused. Yeah. We know yeah. this from the 84 changes that, you know, people turn up once every three years and say, oh, I haven't voted. What do I do? Now, on the expressive front. Yeah, well, um, exactly right. Preferences work as a way of expressing um, who you should vote for second. And so this is, you know, number one, if you're thinking about how to vote this weekend, you know, vote vote one us. It's your primary vote. Primary preference, in other words, is number one. Who yep. do you want number one to represent your point of view? Secondly, it comes into it as like, okay, well, if it's not us, it's these guys. Yep. So in a way, it's acting as cues to um, your overall ideology. And also, yep. it's a great way sometimes of localising a campaign and making it more important at a local level. So, you know, maybe, yeah, okay, you're good in Canberra, but you recognise that these other guys here, they're really great as well. You, they're doing stuff you think you can recognise with and express with and, and connect with. 
give them your second your second um, choice. And well, it's a reminder, isn't it, that we're having 150 local elections we as are. much as we're having one national Exactly, election. and we talked about this earlier on in, in the show for those who watch all the way through to this point, but... <laughs> all of <we're> you. <laughs> all of you. That, that um, how some of we've seen state-based campaigns in the Senate. It's, it's been a long time since we've seen state-based campaigns being run in the Senate. Nick Xenophon isn't just one of them. Oh. Okay, I know, enough, I know enough about Nick Xenophon, but... Look, locally, yeah, we're seeing some really strong campaigns emerge now at this part of the um, election period where we're seeing some really great independents come up with ideas and some big battles independents happening. Independents, though, and that's the that's thing, right. right? The major Windsor parties aren't doing this. Against um, Barnaby Joyce. Barnaby's had to come out and go even more to the right to seem <laughs> as though he, like, he's going the Bob Catter approach. Oh, hang um, on. If you saw his statement the other night on, on TV, on, on ABC, where he made his, um, his, his announcement, he sounded to the big guys, you know, I'm the guy from the bush. Staying up. He has to do that because he's not getting that momentum against the independent Tony Windsor. That's mm, the thing. I don't know. I think Barnaby's got runs on the board here. Uh, thoughts for the week? Um, two thoughts for the week for me. One is that I hear that the Nick Xenophon team is making some inroads in Queensland and it might be picking Ooh. up some of those Palmer votes that yeah. from people who are looking to put their votes somewhere other than the major mm. parties. And the second thought is if Britain votes to leave the EU next week, um, we could see major economic consequences quickly and that could have an impact on the campaign. Mm. Yeah, um, my final thoughts is it, the economy has been bubbling away there for a while now. I think we're going to start to see it ramp up again, particularly with the Brexit being talked about. Mm. Um, it's, you know, it's really happening again too with um, on the weekend, Bill Shorten um, hitting Tasmania, making more promises. He has to pay for these somehow. It's getting back to the revenue generation discussion we've not had yet in the campaign. That is utterly boring. <laughs> I, think, I know. I think Sorry. this week's going to be all about Oakshot and Windsor. Yep. And I think Oakshot in particular. And let's see what they have to say. Who's that again? <laughs> we'll remember in time. Again, thanks for watching and we'll see you next week.